Go. All right. Uh, December 17th. Welcome, everybody. This is the final meeting of 2018 for the Miami Township Board of Trustees. We're one trustee short. We're also a road administrator short and a fire chief short this evening. But we're going to make it up in quantity and quality. Uh, we're going to do a small amount of brief amount of business and then uh, uh -oh, a couple of things. Oh, I got my glasses. Uh, brief amount of business and then move right into the part of the. Uh, Meeting. So, I would uh, entertain a motion to adopt the minutes of December 3rd. Uh, so move. Moved. I will second that. And further discussion regarding those minutes? Yes. For some reason, you 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 double entered half most of the correspondence. Did I? Yeah. You put oh, all well, the correspondence in and then because put it in again. Because computers don't like me and I hate them, so. <laughs> so, I, so, yeah, yeah I, I, I tried to fix that. <laughs> So now they're right. Um, as amended. As amended. As right. amended. May we vote, please? Mr. Hollister? Yes. Mr. Meacher? Yes. I now entertain a motion to adopt special uh, minutes of special meeting December 11th. Now, I was not present at that meeting, Ooh, but I will good. go ahead and move that we adopt those minutes. Is that okay? No, I don't think we can do that. Why don't we put that off till next meeting? Till next year. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. You pretty much, I think you pretty much have to be there. As Sorry simple as they were. As simple as it was. You know. Yeah, exactly. I now entertain a motion to approve payment of bills of $29,817.89, broken down general fund $2,854.79, fire fund $17,000. $26.15, cemetery fund $98.94, EMS billing $4,263.18, road bridge $5,574.83, capital projects zero. Goodness. Mm -hmm. Is there a motion? I so move. A second. Any further discussion regarding payment of those counts? Hearing none, may we vote, please. Mr. Mutcher? Yes. Mr. Hollister? Yes. Uh, to help out timing on our agenda, I'm going to dispense with correspondence. Uh, fire department wrote, report uh, road administrator and cemetery report for the evening. And uh, I think we will then continue after uh, information from the floor. I think we talked about asking... Uh, Dave to go first. Right? That, well, that works. Okay. If you have uh, anything that you'd like to begin with? Well, yes. I, um, I did bring a, a resolution of support for the Avaria Trail this evening, if that's something that you would consider, and if that's possible with, um, you know, with uh, Mr. Crockett not being here. Um, but uh, I uh, had sent some, some information, um, and I hope that was illuminating um, as far as, as uh, what our plans are and what the um, what the, the grant requires and what we're putting in place. Um, you know, I I feel like we're we're making very good progress on this application. We've got letters of coordination from all of the environmental agencies that we need now. Um, just letters saying that you know. We're working with you, and here's the post, kind of what we're going to need mm -hmm. uh, for you to uh, get this approved. Um, and uh, you know, I definitely have learned something about trail maintenance. So um, that's that's where we sit right now. Okay, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb a little bit and, and speak briefly um, about what I think are some some issues that are going on with this, and mostly zoning issues, and then. Richard's here, and I'm going to probably turn it over to him to, to continue the discussion. But going through this, um, I kind of see things uh, instead of one issue, that I, I believe there are two issues, and I'm, uh, I highlighted some things uh, in your benefits provided letter, 
And just going over those very briefly, they will lead into why I think we've moved this into two different categories. We're talking about um, your writing that you, some of your benefits are that you're going to provide regular dinners, gardening workshops, um, concerts, uh, install picnic tables at appropriate points, provide for weddings, dinners, educational events, going to do some retailing, going to have business traffic out there at the, at the, um, at the site, uh, you refer to agritourism, uh, problems with traffic, hazards and backups. Um, with, those sorts of, with those sorts of things in mind, uh, uh, again, I'm going to go to the zoning, but I don't believe any of those are permitted uses in an agricultural district. Now, they may be permitted uh, to, to a larger or a smaller extent uh, in an agritourism district, which is an overlay, which my understanding is the parcel more than likely qualifies for. Again, this is a conversation between you all. But as such, David, I, I don't see how we can go to the second half of this issue, that is our support for something that's not a permitted use, or, or at least the intent of the use of it, is for not a permitted use in the district that it's in now. That's going to mess your timing up, because for you to get an agri-zoning designation, is going to require a, a bit of time, and you can discuss that with, with Richard. So I'm, I'm, I'm about as far out as, in that limb as I want to go. Uh, unless you want to jump in, you know, I'd like to have them make a uh, conversation. Uh, one of, I would just add to your uh, consideration of how does this fit with zoning. Um, an education institution is permitted in that culture zone. Absolutely. Um, before we get into a full on, and I, I am very, um, I, I would really would like to learn a lot more about pursuing an agriculture designation and the timing that would take. Um, I, I want to say that some of that language is from last year's application, and that particular page uh, is one that I didn't get to update a whole lot before sending it over to you. Um, a lot of those programs that we had in mind, we are definitely toning down those ideas for the time being. Um, and we, if you look at our, our calendar now, we have almost exclusively educational um, events on the calendar. Um, and that, yeah, I mean, we, we've learned more about um, you know, effective programming and land use and those kind of things as the years progressed. Um, and we're, we're definitely um, interested in pursuing uh, that designation, but for the time being, uh, the kinds of, a lot of the kinds of programming that you have on there are more speculative than our own. Um, so I do apologize that that was not, I didn't update that um, from last year's application. Um, so, so I, that, that's what I wanted to put in there. And now, um, if uh, you know, if what uh, if what Mr. Mucher was saying, if that brought things to mind for you, um, I would love to, to hear what those are. Well, this is the first time I've heard that list. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, shall I speak to this now? Certainly. Okay. The. The building of the trail um, is, is, from a zoning standpoint, is a totally separate issue from what's happening on your property. Okay? But there's kind of a, a funny chicken and egg thing, which is our, our um, comprehensive plan talks about you know, what we as, 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 as township, all township residents have agreed we, how we want the future to unfold outside of, of Yellow Springs, says that we consider multi-use paths a good thing, and, and specifically we say that, um, if I interpret this right, and it's a little bit vague, paths that have a destination are what we want, as opposed to just a recreational loop or something like that. But there's a chicken and egg. There isn't a destination yet. 
Okay, so you know, can you encourage building a trail to something that may or may not materialize? And then you could say, well, the trail is part of what will make it materialize. Anyway, that's one issue that I, that I want to bring up as far as the plan goes. The second one is that it says, when there's something like this, which is, which is part of, has a component that, that the township is interested in, and also has a, a private or a citizen's component, the citizens need to work with the township to talk, to, to work out, does this make sense? Not a, a private entity. Okay, so that, that's the second one. The third thing is that overall our comprehensive plan says we want to preserve the natural and agricultural areas of the township. Okay? And I spent a little time looking at your drawing and, and doing some quick measurements and it looks like you're talking about cutting down over an acre of trees to put this trail in. Well, um, actually... Uh, 20 feet wide, 3,000 feet through the woods. Well, um, I, we, I, I, I do have an engineer coming out soon um, so we can rewalk the trail. And, and one of the landowners, um, uh, the main one who owns the woods, has upped his offer to a, a place where if the engineer feels like it might work just as well, we may go to the north of that big stand of trees mm -hmm. that's on... Uh, Rick Donahoe's right. property. Um, so uh, that, okay. would, that would cut down. Okay. The point is, so I mentioned yeah. that just as, but then we're, you know, whether we're taking out trees or we're taking out farmland, we're taking over an acre of land out of, of either natural or agricultural production, which is not the goal of the comprehensive plan. Okay, so there's, there is that issue in, in, a, in a very general sense. And those, and for example, the most of the trail crosses prime agricultural land, which is specifically, you know, the best soils for agriculture. It's not in an area where there are some standard soils or there isn't, you know, good, I mean, from the soil survey, and that's how prime agricultural soils are defined. So it's, it's not in a low impact kind of place, all right? It's, it's in a higher impact kind of place. And then, as you know, it's also challenging because it's, because it's also in a fairly, for lack of a better term, wet place. It's got two, two extreme crossings, one of which has a significant floodplain. So it's, it's a challenge to, to do it with, with minimum impact to the natural environment. So that's, those are the principal things that I want to bring out that are written here in the, in the plan. And, and I excerpted most of those things, both you know, positive and negative about the trail and, and sent that to the trustees. And if you want to get a copy of that, I can, can send it to you as well. Great, yeah, no, I would love to have a copy of that um, so we can address all those, all those concerns uh, as best we can. Um, I, I do want to point out that, I mean, if we do, like you say, it's either, you know, it's, it's got, there's either forested land or agricultural land there. There's nothing else. Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, but if we did, I, I'm just kind of, you know, uh, in answer to what you're saying about the, the agricultural use, um, with it not being that wide of a trail, um, there is an area, uh, I, I've walked it, and there is an area just to the south of those fields, um, right by the tree line, that's consistently mowed. It's a lane that's used for, you know, agricultural upkeep and, and vehicles turning and whatnot. Uh, between the, the tree line and the, the agricultural area. So I think, you know, it's quite possible that if we put a trail in there in the 20-foot corridor, that impact towards either forest or agriculture could be minimized. In, in some areas forest. that's possible, in other areas it isn't. Right. But I've walked it too. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, right, so exactly how those things are going to be addressed, I guess, is the big you know, the, where we're getting to. Right. Um, well, I mean, one of the things that, that, that is in the plan, and, and, and I know from experience, grading, moving soil around, to, is one of the most invasive things you can do the, to the environment. It changes drainage patterns, it, it, it changes, you know, the soil horizons, 
you're, you're going to be bringing in many, 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 many tons of gravel, it, you're, you're significantly changing the environment. Uh, so that, you know, we have, there has to be a, a very strong, I think, reason to give up that, that land as it is, especially since I don't know if you've pursued, but, but Dayton Yellow Springs Road has a generous um, right-of-way. There's, there probably is the potential of having a, a trail with the highway, but not on the highway. Um, and and that the, would not impact any agricultural land. What is the width of the Dayton Yellow Springs right I don't I don't know the number off the top of my head. I just know from, from working with, with um, ODOT and picking up trash along Dayton Yellow Springs Road that <laughs> we pick up trash out of a large area between the pavement and the, and the fence lines or field lines. It, it, is gen it is a big swale at this point on both sides, so it isn't a, a slam dunk, but there, there probably is that potential. I don't know, you, you have to ask. That's, I'm not, the, not the, the engineer. Well, I do have an engineer coming out soon for a visit. Um, so, you know, that gives me one more thing to ask him about. Mm -hmm. um, What's the deadline for this cycle? February 1st. And is that annual or biannual? Annual. Um, I'd like to swing back real quick to uh, again another chicken and the egg where where we started whether it's whether it's an agritourism enterprise zone whatever or educational right usage either one of those is going to have to go through Richard and be permitted uh, formally so yeah, I mean you you cannot just I mean in zoning at least you can't designate your own okay this is what we are and so consequently we can do this, that, other thing. It, it has to go through the, the process of, of being uh, screened by the zoning administrator, inspector. Yeah, um, David, I've had a couple of meetings where we've talked about this at length, and everybody said, well, we don't know what we're doing yet. Yeah. To me. Right. Okay, so, you know, we're still figuring it out, we're still deciding. Even though things are operating now, which are not exactly agriculture, <laughs> okay? Um, well, that's one thing I wanted to ask about. What were you saying, Mr. Hollister, about um, agro, uh, I mean, uh, agriculture, uh, education, educational activities being allowed somewhat on an agriculture? The, the, I can't recite it word for word, but in the, the first couple sentences of our uh, agriculture um, chapter of the, of the zoning chapter, yeah. Uh, the general categories of land use, well, as you can guess, mostly is farm description, and then it, and it says church or educational okay, institution. Don, you're, you're in the old one, but we just amended that whole <laughs> chapter. Those extra things are long. They were not compatible with the comprehensive plan. Well, I may be wrong. There, there. I don't. Ha I didn't bring my code with me tonight, so uh, we can the, the we can discuss on, that at a, a the new code's on the desk. Is the is the yeah. is the update? Yes. Is it updated for the agricultural section? It's it's it's. Actually, yeah. There's an attachment to it. Oh, there's an attachment. A complete okay. attachment. Well, if you um, do, we want to go through that now. I, I think it would be okay. You know, illustrative for no, them to. Uh, right. Are you getting one? Dog? I think I'm getting it. Oh, okay. To know where we are. Yeah, it would be, and I. Um, you know, I, I feel like I should apologize for the use of your time. Um, so we're here. We're here. This is this know. is this is public time. You can spend all you like. <laughs> well, I you know I it's not, I go to sleep, but I, I always do prefer to look before I dive into a pool. I do like to look and see what the, the footage is. Uh -huh. But then I don't when see you it. think you? when you think you know what it is, and then you dive, and then you you know you discover it's different when you're in the water. Yeah. Oh yeah. And you got to re dive. So. Um, well, welcome to the local college. government. <laughs> we do a lot of swimming here. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to uh, to say that wasn't my intention, and I'm not I'm not trying to, you know, uh, to bring something half-baked in. Mm -hmm. That's fine, that's fine. Um, you know, 
And I just had I been asked, you know, earlier, I, I might have saved a little time and, and, and suggested you spend more time with Richard than, than with the board. Um, but, you know, as I say, we're here right? and we're interested. And, you know, in, in a general way, we're certainly supportive, but, you know, it, it has to be something that we can do. Um, you know, if you don't know, I'm going to tell you, uh, trustees, townships, can only do what is uh, allowed by the Ohio Revised Code. If it doesn't say that we can do it, we can't do it. And virtually everything that we do, uh, if, if, we're, if we're not sure of what we're doing, most of the time, we have to run it by, um, generally we have to run it by our uh, county prosecutor who represents us uh, legally and will give us an opinion as to whether it's something that, that we could do. Um, um, I ran this by the prosecutor uh, briefly, and there really probably wasn't enough uh, a detail for, a, you know, for an exact opinion. But what we, what we did have, <coughs> she reminded us that uh, townships are not empowered to provide um, services to non-public entities. So that could have ended up being a bit problematic in, in maintenance uh, and uh, repairs uh, you know, in a project like this. Uh, again, that, that's a little premature, but I, I do know there's a, you know, the foundation of that uh, in the code. I see. So that is something else. The attachment's in the very back, if you didn't see Yeah, I, well, okay. I, in the front there's... There's some material, but it's not all of it. Oh. So I'm, I would prefer, since I'm not familiar with this latest um, printing, to not say absolutely one thing or another until I have my book in front of me. But um, because of the comprehensive plan saying that primarily we want the rural areas of Miami Township to be agriculture or, or natural areas as they already are, that um, we eliminated most of the other uses in the agricultural zone except residential, which we've always always had, um, single family dwellings. The, there, so many of those things that used to be there, like like public facilities and educational institutions and churches are no longer there for the agricultural zone. They're considered to be appropriate in other zones, but not that one. Um, the agritourism designation requires whatever you do to be directly agriculturally related. It isn't, the tourism isn't the, the key component, it's the agri in, in front of it. So for example, a wedding is not agritourism. Right. Okay. Um, education about agriculture would be appropriate, okay? Education about some other subject would not be appropriate. Yeah. It, it has to be that connection with agriculture. And there's a, a long, fairly wide definition of agriculture here in the state of Ohio. You can read that so you can see what you might be able to relate. You could, you could probably teach somebody winemaking and it would pass for being agriculturally related. But you, but you uh, probably couldn't teach somebody how to make ice cream, yeah. because that's not been considered by the state to be part of agriculture. I see. Okay. I mean, I think if you know, if I look at our calendar, and I just was today, um, I think you know, um, all the programming I can think of right now is uh, is agriculturally related, um, and uh, you know, I would. I, of course, I would want to look at that definition. I guess it's in the Ohio Code, right? No, then we have it in our code, too. Okay, yeah, so um, is that a publicly available document? I can send you a One way or another, copy. yes. Okay. Flash drive in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> you, have, yeah, you can read off the back. Agricultural production, so I have... Okay, commercial animal or poultry husbandry, aquaculture, aquaculture meaning the 
farming of algae, apiculture, animal husbandry or poultry husbandry, production for a commercial purpose of timber, field crops, tobacco, fruits, vegetables, nursery stock, ornamental shrubs, ornamental trees, flowers, or sod. The growth of timber for a non-commercial purpose if the land on which the timber is grown is contiguous or part of a parcel of land under common ownership that is otherwise devoted exclusively to agricultural use. Or any combination of such, such husbandry, production, or growth, and includes the processing, drying, storage, and marketing of agricultural products when those activities are conducted in conjunction with such husbandry, production, or growth. Land devoted to biodiesel production, biomass energy production, electric or heat energy production, or biologically derived methane gas production, if the land on which the production facility is located is contiguous to or part of a parcel of land under common ownership that is otherwise devoted exclusively to agricultural use. Um, I think I can stop there. There's, it, it, it's very general, but it still is what most of us sure. think of as agriculture. Yeah, yeah, I, that, I was able to follow that pretty well. Uh, back to a version of what you started with. There are two, you see two issues. One is a trail to a destination, uh, and then the, the uh, it, it begs the question, which is not part of the uh, grant application, and therefore not of our formal, directly of our formal resolution, uh, what is, is the destination a use that has been permitted in, in the zoning? Uh, is the construction of a trail something that would have to be permitted? That is, if, if a farmer decides to put in a no, we, road... We, a farmer can put all the roads they want. There's no, we have no regulation. And if a permitted use in an agriculture zone wants to put in a trail, a bike trail that involves serious no. a bridge, okay. uh, if grading, then does it require a zoning permit? Let, my response is that if someone opens up their land to public use, that's a little different than them putting in a driveway. Okay, on their mm -hmm. property for their use. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's a, I know in terms of things like liability, there's a big difference whether you charge somebody to do something or don't charge them to do something. Um, I also know in terms of, of uh, if you let the public onto your property, it becomes difficult to ever stop the public from coming onto your property because you've, you've kind of given away that land to the public. Um, I don't know how a trail like this and its funding works. If, if say, the, the Donahoe's said, you know, this, this, we turned out we don't really like having this trail across our property. Can they close it? Well, I mean, in this, in that particular case, he's, he's offering to donate land. To okay, so he's actually selling land, so it'll be your land. Donating, yeah, yes. But, yeah, yes. that's still changing hands. Yes. The ownership is, is the critical component. Yes, now one of the other landowners is just going to give us an easement. Mm -hmm. um, and that's for a certain amount of time. Okay. Um, I, I imagine they'd have legal recourse if they wanted to revoke that. Okay. But I don't know. But anyway, so so now we're we're changing to see. What gets interesting in all of this is 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 now that you're let's say it's all your land. All right. You're you're now doing an activity which is providing a multi-use path, which is an agriculture. Oh, the, the trail itself is not an agriculture. Right. Even if it I don't, that's why I, I'm just yeah. running that around in my head saying, oh, if it's not a, a public path, then, I mean, even getting your funding, doesn't that make it have to be? Yeah, it has to be I a don't public know what, how, how something is guaranteed is public if it's on private yeah. property. Absolutely. It has to be a guaranteed public trail. And okay, we're, so we're comfortable what, with that. We what do we need for a court to What do we need to do or know? Uh, to have an up or down vote on a resolution of support. Well, I would need to know at the, at the very least that 
it's a it's a designated agritourism um, area, and that's a conditional use, and it has to be approved by the BZA. Um, it, 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 in the bottom line is I don't see how I can support something that I don't know what I'm supporting because we don't know what exists yet. Well, I mean, about the destination, right? I guess I, I have to. I, a big deal for us is going to <coughs> be um, the legality of educational programming. Um, that's what has been going on, and what. So that's that's why that's why I would make the argument that it already is a destination because we have done some educational programming out there um, with the the schools um, and uh, you know a workshop uh, that was definitely agriculturally related. Um, so uh, we do have a track record of people attending things, uh, uh, and, uh, and I'm sure you would have no problem. I think, you know, convincing the board zoning appeals of that and then being granted a agritourism, it's not an overlay, what is it, Richard? Well, it, it, it's a permit, it's establishing the, the permitted use on your property for what you're going to do. So that, that would need, what, the, to do educational programming, we would need the agritourism uh, designation. designation. Yeah, that's not, um, it's not an agri, it's not, it's not an activity that's allowed. It, it's a business taking place on a farm. Right. It's not farming. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so that that winds up being the big issue um, is getting getting that agritourism de designation. I guess so. It's a zoning appeals board. Well, no. It's it's coming to me with with stating what it is that you're going to do under that statute. Okay. If I am comfortable with the definition of agritourism, which I still have that, and that it fits, then I can say, okay, if I'm not, if I say, nope, I don't think that's agritourism, then you can go to the BZA and have them decide. I see. Okay. All right. don't, I'm it, sorry, Dave, I, yeah. I led you astray there. Yeah. Well, it, no, I, I it, 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 agritourism is very strange from, a, a, I don't know, a bureaucratic approach or whatever. The, the state of Ohio, in general, tells us what we can do. This time they told us what we had to do. Okay. And that we had to permit agritourism. Okay. Um, and we, there's, there are some things that we can regulate about it. So in other words, okay. if you're going to go with agritourism, then we have to look at the ingress and egress on your property for traffic. We have to look at your parking. Okay. There are some things that, that we have to be concerned about. And there are other things that we have no concerns over. Um, unlike some, some of the other normal zoning procedures that we go through. So it's, it's, it's new and it's unusual, so it, it does, it's not surprising <laughs> that people don't understand exactly how it works. Right. But um, the, the sense I had the last time I talked with agrarian representatives was that you were still trying to make up your minds what it was you were going to be doing. I see. And I didn't feel pressure to say, okay, if you're trying out this or trying out that. If you've got a definite program now and you know where you're going, yet yeah, it is time to make sure that that meshes with the zone. Yeah, okay. okay. All right. Um, then, you know, I think I do, um, do want to go to Susan and make sure that we have, you know, the right um, approach to, to go, you know, to bring to you um, in that you know, in that area, with that purpose. Um, so uh, then, you know, I mean, it's it's not great for the timing, but I'm gonna say maybe there's still a chance. You know, <laughs> you guys have a couple more meetings uh, before we uh, we have to go do with the grant, and it's possible that um, we could submit without this, you know, particular issue being resolved, and then, you know, there's not um, that there. There's kind of a, a timeline with the grant, mm -hmm. um, and it, you know it's 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 strict in, in certain areas that you have to have up front, but it's not um, you know he doesn't expect everything to you know be bought, sold, stamped, and, um, and, and uh, I'm going to ask a, a question: that when you apply, do you have to give any kind of indication of the estimated 
traffic on the on the on the path on the trail. No. Or or a number of people that you're serving at your destination. I don't. I, there's not a heavy emphasis on that. I'll have to look, look at the application again and see if it asks for those numbers. Mm -hmm. We may we, we may have supplied some speculative numbers last year, but I don't know that it really is required. What from from my vantage point, and I'm not the trustees, is that for Miami Township as a as a governmental entity to support, um, say, you know, we endorse this trail, it's got to be to the benefit of a significant number of Miami Township residents, not just you know a, a, some small quantity, because then we're because we're talking about a lot of money to build this trail. I mean, it isn't coming out of the pockets of of the township residents at the present time, but is that you know an effective use of the money, or would it make more? You know, are we are we fighting for dollars that should go to the Clifton Connector, or should go to the, the bicycle path to Youngs, or you know some other um, trail that might serve more people in the township? Yeah, well, um, you know, our um, what we've done so far has definitely. <coughs> Served local residents um, uh, to a, a large degree. Yeah, there certainly mm -hmm. have been people from out of the area that have also come, but primarily it's served uh, local residents, and that's a huge priority for us. And remains. And then the the grant that we got from the uh, Ohio EPA uh, for educational programming definitely um, uh, it allows that to you know to expand. I mean. I don't know. I, I, as far as Miami Township itself goes, um, that's mainly the residents that you're talking about, right? So if I well, talk to you about we are <laughs> Miami Township here. Yeah, that's who we're, so, yeah, exactly. who we're representing, right? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, it's it's definitely you know a lot of the programming directly serves local residents. So we can you know we can provide figures of what we've done so far and what are our, our, just our scheduled activities for the year, what kind of impact they would have. Oh, yeah. These gentlemen might want to know that. Yeah, yeah, we definitely can can get you know um, if if you want to to see numbers of what you know the we think that you know what we've who we served so far and what we'll serve this year, we can definitely uh, provide that. Yeah. yeah, that'd be great, and perhaps a, a more up to date uh, benefits. Uh, yeah. Statement. Yeah, I for sure. We'll Okay, anything else? Tom? Nope. Richard? David? Dale? Margaret? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for all of this. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure, indeed. Thank you. Okay, we're going to jump across the room. <laughs> hey, David, you're welcome to listen to. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Hello. My name is Dale Arnold, I'm Director of Energy, Utility, and Local Government Policy with the Ohio Farm Bureau. I've known Don for a number of years. I've been with the Ohio Farm Bureau for 34 years, 20 some, well, 28, 29, in the position I'm at right now. Um, Ohio Farm Bureau is a member organization. Um, when you join Farm Bureau, you join the county where you live. Uh, the State Farm Bureau, which is the Ohio Farm Bureau and the American Farm Bureau, all in one membership vertically integrated system. Depending where you're at, basically in Ohio, there could be anywhere between a low of 295 to 14,000 member families because the membership is with the family. Um, the State Farm Bureau has 117,000 member families and the American Farm Bureau has 4.5 million. So I work for the Ohio Farm Bureau, so I coordinate and work with a lot of counties and help them do things on a regional level or as a group that no one county can do alone. In energy development, I'm the person basically when a Farm Bureau member or community basically has an issue, a need or concern having to do anything with oil and gas, pipelines, electric transmission lines, interconnection basically with utilities, wind, solar, biomass, fuel cell, uh, energy planning, interconnection with those particular types of things. Uh, community aggregation, and that I'm the person basically as a specialist to come out there and help them with regard to it. So I don't work for state or federal government. I don't work for an energy service provider. I work for basically our members. 
Don and I have had a nice relationship over the last several years because I also do work in education programs for the Township Trustees Association. I've done a number of those at your state conference with Heidi Fowler over the years, as well as with the County Commissioners Association and Energy Development. This is the start of a conversation. I'm not going to be able to tell you everything you want to know when it comes to energy development things here just in one night, but I, this is where I basically start. And I work with a number of your counterparts across the state when they've had questions regarding the energy development. You might consider me what you would call a valid third opinion. Mm -hmm. And I do work with the Power Siding Board folks, the Public Place Commission, energy service providers, a number of people basically in communities and do that on a very regular basis. So if you have any questions whatsoever, and Don and I have talked over the years, and things, please feel free to have me back again. All you really need to do is call the Green County Farm Bureau and our organization director, and we can do a full briefing for you, the members of the community, a number of things with regard to that. The reason I'm here and the request from Don is you are seeing a lot with regard to energy development here in this area. It might not be oil and gas. It could be pipelines. You'll be seeing a lot with regard to electric transmission infrastructure through here. But the main question I was asked to talk about tonight was with regard to solar development. A lot of things are happening. Within probably an hour to an hour and a half drive from here, you are seeing upwards of about six different large utility scale solar projects being developed right now under Ohio Power Siding Board jurisdiction. You are going to see several others with regard to that. Here in this particular township, not necessarily yet, but in neighboring townships around you, Greene County not yet, but in many of the neighboring counties you're seeing that all. Uh, Don also asked me to talk about um, what the Ohio Power Siding Board is because there's been a lot of concerns too when you think about it. When you talk about energy development, if this particular project was under 50 megawatts of capacity, if it was a small business, a farm, um, a factory here basically in the area, you would have jurisdiction over that particular siding process. If it's 50 megawatts or more since 1973, it's the jurisdiction basically of the Ohio Power Siding Board. Um, please rest assured also, too, is the rules and regulations that are in place for renewable energy development are the same rules that are in place if you were going to do a coal fire generation facility, a natural gas fire generation facility, a nuclear facility. Wow. With regard to that. A lot of questions, too, is how do local governments get involved in this particular process? Mm -hmm. I can understand and appreciate where you're coming from with regard to you want to take a look at and, and do a number of things, especially quality of life considerations for the people here in this particular township. There's nothing wrong with regard to that. Uh, one of my jobs, basically, Farm Bureau is helping our members, who are also your constituents, help them get involved in that particular process. In Ohio, it's rather unique because since 1973, we have the Ohio Power Siding Board, which if you would think about it, it's different than what you're seeing in Indiana, Minnesota, Illinois, Kentucky, other states, that you literally have a uniform system and process with regard to power siding in all 88 counties. You're talking S-I-T-I-N-G. Yes, okay. S-I-T-I-N-G, power no, siding. S-I-G-H-T-I-N-G. <laughs> Placement of a power right, plant. Right, right. Anything having to do with transmission over 32 kilovolts of capacity across the line. And anything having to do, if this was a wind plant, anything over 5 megawatts of capacity is an economically significant wind farm. But everything else is 50 megawatts of capacity or more, which is solar. Um, be, um, in Ohio, you've had that structure in place since that particular time. It is a uniform set of rules, a uniform set of technical requirements, a uniform set of evaluation processes and different things with regard to that. Um, and in years past, it's served us extremely well. In my work with the Ohio Farm Bureau over the last 30 years, we advocate basically for utilization of the process. Um, and in that process, there is a tremendous amount of requirements with regard to technical, aesthetic, economic, quality of life, 
those particular types of processes. I would also like you to think about it this way. Um, if you don't remember anything else I've said tonight, is that process in this state is a judicial process. I want you to think about it basically as a court process. Because if you're going to do any permitting with regard to power siding or transmission lines above 32 kilovolts, that process basically is very much a judicial one. Which means this, the, the case basically, or the project, and they are trying to and will be applying for what's called a certificate of convenience, public need and necessity, or in layman's terms, a permit, is that um, in that it's a proceeding. An attorney examiner with the power of a judge will have the jurisdiction over that particular process. There will be a number of hearings and evaluation programs with regard to it. Uh, there will be the opportunity, if you want to become a party of record in those proceedings, uh, with regard to examination, cross-examination, delivery of evidence, anything you can do in a judicial proceeding in a local court, you'll be able to do there. There's also a process. A township yes. can be a... Yes. What I'm saying is this. again a... Yeah, a party of record. What I'm saying, give me an idea, and I can get into more detail or answer more questions about it. That's the process here. What's interesting about this process, people have been asking, well, how does the local government get involved in this process? And believe it or not, there's the opportunity, and I call it the responsibility for local governments to get involved basically in the process. So where you, with your county prosecutor, who is your legal counsel, as you said, you have the ability to become a party of record in those particular proceedings. Which means, say, if someone wants to do a project, be it a solar farm, here in this particular township, you have the right, and I would say the responsibility as township trustees, where you can file a motion to intervene, become a party of record in the case. As a matter of fact, under the law, and under the rules of the Power Siding Board, local governments, township, county, municipal that are impacted, automatically have right of intervention. All they have to do is request to be involved basically in case proceedings. We're involved in a number of case proceedings. I'm involved right now through Farm Bureau on behalf of our members involved in nine different solar farm siding cases across the state. To do that, I had to file a formal motion to intervene and show, with regard to the laws, why we should be considered basically having intervention status or party of record status. I can tell you this, based on our policy, based on the work that we have done, based on the collective experience of our members, we've been able to become parties of record in all those particular cases. It does allow us basically to take a look at the number of special particular needs that you want to have addressed as this project goes forward. Mm -hmm. Which means this, if this does happen in this township, be it a transmission line case, be it a pipeline case under their jurisdiction, which you might see here, or be it basically a solar farm, you have the right basically to intervene in that case, and you have the right to negotiate a number of stipulations and agreements with regard to quality of life. But what kinds of Give some uh, an, an example. An example with regard to that. Or um, um, it I was, might be effective. No, it might be effective. Well, we're sitting right now. If you take a look at it, basically, who has fire um, protection for the township? The question is, if you have a generation facility, which this will become, who has fire protection for that? Your township fire department. Who should be doing training in different things so your firemen have training that, that there is a mishap there or something needs to be done. They have specialized training to be able to address those particular needs of that facility. The company should be working very closely with you that on a very regular basis, more than just once in a lifetime or probably once or twice a year, come and does special training basically with you guys regarding that. Do you need special equipment? Who should pay for that? It shouldn't come basically from the tax dollars of different things in the community. The company should pay for that basically itself. That's one provision. Who provides the security for it? Do you have a local township police department? Same way there with regard to that. If you did, you know, 
security and different things, what are some things, specialized training that needs to be done there? Those are things you can stipulate. Those are things that you can advocate for in the judicial proceedings regarding that. Those are things you can negotiate. Drainage? Well, I will also say this too. Um, there are seven particular things that the power siding board has to take a look at by Ohio statute before they are allowed to issue a certificate. One of those has to do with uh, water conservation practices, which means basically farm drainage. If you think about it, this is going to be on a piece of land someplace in the township. Much of the, much of the area basically is agriculture. You have a lot of farmers that over the years who have invested in farm drainage, be it subsurface field tile, be it uh, gabions or any other kinds of conservation surface practices. One thing that we negotiated in this process, and I say welcome aboard, you know why I'm in this, this, I used to be the executive director of the Ohio Land Improvement Contractors Association, the drainage contractors. Mm -hmm. I understand the ag engineering extremely well. Negotiating in there, if this particular piece of grounds use is going to change from agriculture to power production, which it will, there's a number of different conservation practices and drainage structures in there because that piece of ground not only drains that particular area, but it's part of the drainage coefficient for the entire valley. All those need to be maintained, mm -hmm. all those need to be upheld, and all those cannot be changed. Mm -hmm. uh, I want you to also think about this. Um, another provision would be uh, if you take a look at working with the landowner, um, that ground might be in corn, wheat, bean production, or animal husbandry. It is going to change because you can put a solar array on there. What are you going to put underneath that? Are you going to gravel that all off? Uh, could that also be utilized for grasses and different things? What are you going to plant underneath there? Should you have a say on what kind of vegetative material, what kind of maintenance schedule, what kind of mowing and different things you're going to do there? There are 27, by Ohio Revised Code, there are 27 different grasses, weeds, and different things that are considered noxious. Mm -hmm. ah. Which means those can't be there. One thing we've been able to do with the projects going forward that are now permitted, pollinator habitat is absolutely positive. Mm -hmm. Bees, butterflies, special flora and fauna. With regard to that, is that something that the local township government can get involved in? The answer is always yes. Aesthetics. Um, one thing in the project you'll see from the permit, they have to do a computer enhanced set of pictures of what is this thing going to look like in the community. When you talk about aesthetics, when you talk about the viewscape, are there some things that can be done with regard to landforming? Trees, fencing, other vegetative masking, other ways of aligning basically the solar array basically to be aesthetically pleasing. Do you have a say with regard to that? Can you work with local landowners and others with regard to that in the company as part of the process? The answer is, oh yes. That's another reason basically for that. Um, when you talk about um, taxes, it's interesting. While agricultural ground is governed by CAUV, and I'll stand to be corrected. Mm -hmm. When you take a look at power production ground or utility ground, it's the highest tax bracket. Mm -hmm. Tax brackets are changing. We have what's called a pilot payment, or payment in lieu of taxes, which means this. The company has the opportunity and responsibility if this is going to be a renewable energy facility. There are a number of prerequisite requirements by the Ohio Revised Code. One of those is they can go in to apply with the Director of Development, or Development Service Agency, DSA, showing that this particular facility is a renewable energy facility. If it meets those prerequisite requirements, they receive a certificate directly from the Department of Development saying that they are. The next step is, under the law, they go basically to the county government here in Green County. The county government has the ability to do one of three things. Number one is that if they have that certificate, they can, at any time, if they want to, um, through resolution, make the entire county a renewable energy development zone, which means any company that meets those prerequisite requirements that wants to come to Green County 
as the ability to do so. Or they can take a look at each individual project and approve each individual project. What do you mean by approve? Approve, which means this. The ultimate saying of them being able to have the pilot tax provision, even though they have a certificate from the Department of Administrative Services, is with the county commissioners. It's local with regard to that. Or they can say, no, if not, there's other taxing things and no one's gone to that particular point. But the focus is the final say with regard to the taxing structure is in the county and in local government. You have the opportunity to work with them in that process because here in this state, um, until the law changes and the law will be up for review in 2020, which means you need to be involved in that process. But the law right now basically says this. As this is being negotiated, you look with the formula. If you're given approval by the county government, um, you are taxed, or the, the structure of your tax is on the number of megawatts of capacity a project has. It doesn't have to be shining sun all the time in different things. It doesn't go on the amount of megawatts to go out. It's on the capacity of the project. So say, for instance, this is a 100 megawatt facility. Um, the basis, basically, is $7,000 per megawatt of capacity. There's also additional negotiations between the county government and township governments need to be involved in that particular process of where between 7,000 and a maximum 9,000 based on the amount of local employees they employ, the amount of equipment and material they use sourced from local companies, that can go anywhere from $7,000 to $9,000 maximum. That money stays in the county. The majority of it, with regard to the formula, which is set basically by the Ohio Revised Code and is followed by your county auditor, goes to your local schools. Another part of that goes to the general fund of the county, and another part of that goes to the general fund of the township where it's located, mm -hmm. which means being involved in those particular negotiations is huge. Also remember this, not everything basically is covered by a tax base. You know as well as I do when you're talking about the projects you're doing with community solutions, or you're talking about local par parks, or you're talking about local development programs that go beyond the tax base. Who are the first people that you see for donations and different things? Are usually the local businesses, your neighbors. <coughs> this project is going to be your neighbor, and they need to understand that for a long time, which means this. Do you have the right, with regard to quality of life provisions, to negotiate on a very regular basis that company in reporting to you on a number of things they're doing in the community and having some things down that over the next 10, 20, 30 years, you are going to be making X investments in this community along these lines and discussing it with township trustees and local government to do so. Is there a precedent for that? No, there isn't, but I tell you this, that's always been part of the project, that's always been part of the rules, mm -hmm. and until very recently, very few people understood that. Case in point, I will tell you this, schools understand that, uh, and schools have used it extremely well in southeastern Ohio when you had a large coal fire generation facility. I grew up in Knox County. My mother's from Geshawkin County. A product of a mixed marriage. <laughs> but no, my mother's family is from Shopping County. You have Conesville Generation Station, which was established in 1957. At that time, basically, schools consolidated in Shopping County, and a number of agreements were made through this process of where that particular facility would be invested in Ridgewood, Shopping City, and in the western part of the county, which was River. And that's a number of provisions that they have done. You have the ability on that scale to do it here. I'm not saying it's going to be millions upon millions of dollars, but it's not chump change either. That's always been part of the process. One of the reasons I'm here, one of the reasons why Heidi Fowl has had me do training with township governments at the Township Trustees Association is to make them aware that they have that opportunity and responsibility to do that.
Just about anything and everything is negotiable in a stipulated agreement. Because in many cases, there are a number of things regarding quality of life that are also negotiated as part of this process. That is also basically given with regard to evidence, which is part of a particular case settlement, which is signed in his agreement in his own file and becomes part of this particular case forever and a day. Mm -hmm. Those are things to be taking a look at. Could, could I pause you? Sure. I'm getting a long enough list of questions that I'm sure. afraid I'm going to forget some of no, them. No, you're fine. Um, when, let's say, I own land and I lease to the power company, who's paying the property taxes? It's well, my land. That's correct. And what we tell members is this, is that, remember, you have a responsibility for that because you still own the land. And you know as well as I do, the minute the use of that land changes, the tax changes. It goes from CAUV. Okay. So this is my next question. You heard yes. me reading like fine print at the end of the contract, right. the definition of agriculture, and it says one of the agricultural production, electric or heat energy production. Well, The state says that's agriculture. Well, remember this. The state basically would say it's agriculture, and I would say this. That's interpreted for on-site generation, distributed generation. If I wanted to have my own farm, and I want to put my own solar array up for my own personal use. So is that how the courts have looked at this? That's, that's how, how I've thought about it from the zoning standpoint. Yes, that's how I look at it. But I'll tell you this, when you're talking about and the permits involved with this, which are federal and state, it's considered a power facility. Okay. But what's I, what I'd like to know is that in between, less yes. than 50 megawatts, more than my personal use or that's my correct. use or whatever, yes. is is that agriculture or is that commercial? And anything over 50 megawatts is considered. No, not I want under 50 under megawatts. Me well, remember this under 50 megawatts. And again, I've also done training with a lot of township trustees, not necessarily down through here, but in what you would call UCLA, Upper Canton, Lower Akron. Mm -hmm. That where if you need to upgrade, your local zoning ordinances to accommodate what you're seeing with regard to wind and solar and other on-site renewables and different things, I can help you with regard to that. I do that particular type of training. A number of townships, and this is another reason I'm here, are looking at those particular rules and regulations because the technology very much is changing. You're saying we do have jurisdiction under 50. That's correct. For, run. for solar under 50, you do. Uh, so it depends on the wording of your particular zoning code. And also remember this. If you have that there, that's great because things you want to take a look at to upgrade that is that, you know, the size. Uh, you want to also take a look at the technology being used. Uh, to make a long story short, instead of going and trying to make a set of zoning ordinances about that thick, there are a number of things you can do with current rules and regulations that show basically is this. If you're doing this for personal use, effective interconnection agreement on file with the incumbent utility, which is state power and light, or your municipal, number one. Number two, all equipment meets underwriters laboratory and ACEEE or the American Council of Energy Engineers compliance with regard to that. You have adequate insurance rider on your farm owners, ranch owners, home, business insurance. You also have a provision in there that this will continue to be serviceable and you have a service contract with a company, a service provider to do regular care, maintenance, and upkeep, and also decommissioning. If this thing basically shuts down or becomes dilapidated, within six months, you basically have the ability through zoning to have it basically removed. You also have, and this is very important, because people in UCLA found this out very quickly, is if I decide to do this on my home, and I live in a five acre lot, well that's great, where am I going to put it? Probably down there in the corner where I didn't see it, which means this, it's going to be in a corner where my neighbor is going to see it, which means placement of those. And also too is this, this doesn't happen with regard to solar, but it will with regard to wind because if you decide to put your own wind turbine up, mm -hmm. you want to have setbacks and such that if there is an adverse event, a tornado or something, 
it falls and stays on your property and does not fall across the line to kill the neighbor's dog. Mm -hmm. right. but, but here's the oh, thing. I don't, I don't want to get into that. We used to have windmills. They're exempt. Okay. okay. All right. You know, but, or at least they are, you know, based on my code. But the other one I want to know is that you were talking about the responsibility of, of the corporate interests who would do a large yes. solar array. Do they have any, res you know, the, the pattern, even here in Ohio, is that farms have gotten bigger which means old farmsteads have been sold off as separate mm -hmm. parcels. So you have residences scattered around that, are, that have nothing to do with farming now. Right. Okay. The, the farms in the area lease all their land, and suddenly my piece of property is now in the middle of a solar array. Right. It's not as nice as it used to be. Well, remember no matter how many trees or bushes they plant. I understand that. Because I'm going is, to there, is that a taking of any no, sort? No, that is not considered a taking because you're still able to use your particular property. Mm -hmm. and I hate to say this, but economic value is not one of those protections guarded by the Constitution. However, can groups of landowners with competent legal counsel who are facing that particular issue be involved in this case as an intervening party? And the answer is yes. Yeah, but would they have any effect? Yes, they would. Because remember this, one thing that's interesting is while this company has to have a number of state and federal permits for interconnection, safety, and those particular types of things, um, these plants are not considered vital services plants. These plants basically are considered what are called merchant plants. Now farmers really get them in an agriculture based business, but you know it's interesting when we talk about corn, wheat, and beans, prices are set like commodities. Supply, demand over time. Calls, puts, collars, mm -hmm. futures, contracts. Energy, flow of electrons is the same way. These companies are building these basically as merchant plants. They will have 30-year long-term power delivery contracts with a number of folks through an energy service provider contract. They're not vital services plant, which also means this, my friend, eminent domain provisions do not apply, which means the ability to negotiate a number of key provisions, like the ones you're taking a look at, are very much part of the process. I mean, on one hand, I figure not my backyard shouldn't be a way of preventing no, but one of these activities because where where is it that it should be? Yeah. Okay. Because you. But on the yeah. other hand, there will be you know some small number of people that are adversely impacted, no matter how nicely. I know. Done. Right. That's, I'm saying that's yes. just the way it is. That's well, what I'm making sure about. That's true, because I tell you this, this is not perfect. It's not the best of all possible worlds. And I understand where you are coming from. I guess it's my work to try to mitigate as much of that, basically, as possible. And yes, I have shown folks who have those particular concerns how to get involved in this process to advocate their position for effective settlements, for movement of solar panels, for a number of particular things. Yes. You told me you have an electronic file for PowerPoint presentation that, yes. that, that you would email us. Yeah, I can give you a copy of that. I would also say this. If you would like to do, have us do a full briefing, because mm -hmm. I'm just going over the tip of the iceberg tonight, um, please call the Green County Farm Bureau. I can also give the contact information for the organization director. Mm -hmm. And we the meeting that we did um, over by... Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, we could do that again. I could also basically update it because I'm doing that on a very regular basis. I'm meeting with a number of folks in a number of townships from as far away as, as Wayne County and Worcester <coughs> to as close as some folks in Crabble County over the last few days, yeah. going into January and February. But it's, it's something, because I tell you this, you are going to be seeing a tremendous amount of energy development basically happening over the next decade or so. And I tell people this, you might see, you know, I'm working with folks right now, pipelines, transmission lines, combined cycle nat natural gas fire turbine generation, wind, solar. 
that will not be the only single project you will see. But what you learn working with one energy service provider is going to serve you extremely well. That, ex that experience is going to serve you again when you have the opportunity and the responsibility to negotiate or discuss with another energy service provider coming mm -hmm. in here. Um, do the larger develop the seller developers like that are going around here and looking for, for leases, are, are they obligated to notify local governments once they get to the point where they put together the 50 megawatts, I guess? Yes, threshold? they do. There, I tell you this, there's a number of things they are allowed to do legally before that tipping point. Hmm. In many cases, you'll find out through here is that are they able to sit down and talk to farmers at their kitchen table? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Are they able to do lease negotiations with individual farmers? The answer is yes. When you talk about the tax thing, we've got to see a UV. Now you know why I work a lot with farmers, because there's a number of things that need to be in that agreement with regard to taxes, mm -hmm. regard to liabilities, and that's one of them. Oh, yeah. But yeah, they will do a number of particular but after a certain tipping point, their first step in the process is they have to go and have a conference with the staff of the Ohio Power Siding Board, sure. state their intentions, and start their particular process with local open house meetings, local education and outreach, mm -hmm. having an office with full-time staff in the community where they're going to be located. A number of things come basically into play. And those are required before there's any approval. That is correct. Um, also, too, when the application is deemed complete, there are a number of things. It takes anywhere between 18 to 36 months for them to do all the technical requirements and research required for a permit. Yeah. Do not be a bit surprised if you see a number of subcontractors that they to do everything from investigation of flora and fauna to economic development work um, to, to technical work basically with PJM, which is your interconnection network, local utilities and that. I tell a lot of farmers you're going to see a lot of indiscreet, indiscreet white trucks and <laughs> jeeps coming out. Um, archaeological work and different things as part of that particular process, but you'll see a number of those things there. Mm -hmm. Once the permit is deemed complete by the Ohio Power Siding Board, you will be served with a copy of it. Your exactly. fit, yes, your okay. fiscal officer will get one of two things. From Federal Ex Express, you'll get three boxes that weigh about 25 pounds piece, and everything will be hard copy. Or what they are allowed to do right now, you'll get a book with three or four DVDs in it with the entire particular application. You will also see that it's a matter of public record, which means you'll be able to access it on the docket, call, docket, docket card by number on the website and download just about anything. Or for those folks who don't have computers, like our, our Amish friends and neighbors, a local public library, a full hard copy of the project's permit process has to be on file there for public Are your yeah. presentations available in printed form or only verbally? Well, this is what I do because there are so many wonderful questions. I will come and do a briefing and then afterwards I have different handouts and different things I can give folks. Also too, another thing we do for our particular members, access to legal counsel is crucial. Mm. Um, 25, 30 years ago, when you saw a lot of oil and gas and energy development, there were a number of local attorneys who were well versed in energy law. There's been a lull from the 1970s until the beginning of this century where many of them got retired, mm -hmm. left the state, or dead. <laughs> There's um, probably, I would say, a half a dozen to a dozen different law firms with attorneys with this knowledge, skill, and expertise. Half of them will not be able to help you because they are working directly for an energy service provider. Mm -hmm. The other half are working for small towns. Um, they are working for farmer, small business, residential consumers. We have a list of those. We don't endorse any one law firm. 
but I have a list of 12 that we refer people to who are well versed in this type of law. To be on that list, um, they have to be referred by Farm Bureau members. They go through an interview process and they're constantly being evaluated with regard to their performance. And yes, we've taken a couple off the list because they've gone over to the dark side of the force. <laughs> but we show people with regard Last to Last time I heard Dale give a presentation, the presenter afterwards was Dylan Borchers from Yellow Springs. Yeah. He's Dylan is, he is an attorney. Yeah. He's with Bricker and Eckler. Mm -hmm. um, Dylan works with Sally Bloomfield. He also works with um, Devin Perena. Um, he's involved um, with several cases representing wind and solar developers throughout the state. And yes, there are times I sit across from him and negotiating the stipulated agreements on the projects that have gone to the power center going so far. But I know Dylan extremely well. I would also say this, because I can stand to be correct, but if I understand Yellow Springs is its own municipal electric company. Yes. Yeah. Amp Ohio, who I work with also there. With We're Jolene Amp Ohio Brown. members. Yes. Uh, with Jolene Brown and Julie Blankenship before she was there. Uh, the number of municipal electric companies who are looking at this to serve their constituents, which is also huge. Bowling Green Municipal Electric Company has its own wind plant on US 6, south of town, which is also shared under AMP contracts with nine other municipal electric companies, from Bryan to Cuyahoga Falls. They also have under operation their solar array north of town, north of the fairgrounds on 65. The closest one to you, and it might be worthwhile to take a look at for a number of things, is Minster, Ohio, which is about an hour and 15, hour 20 minutes from here along I-75. They have their own solar array. It has enough megawatt capacity to serve the regular base note load needs of the community. But it doesn't serve, the, the, the electricity generated from the solar array does not go directly into the service grid. They also invested in what's called battery backup capacitor or storage system. Mm -hmm. And so the solar arrays power and charge the capacitor and that serves the community. And so it's base load, 724, 365. Mm -hmm. But it gives you some idea about what the municipals are doing. Mm -hmm. Also municipal electric, electric companies are regulated by community charter. As you know, they are not under PUCO jurisdiction, mm -hmm. which means they have full say with regard to how those are particularly developed. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to transmission line capacity, whatever, however, I think you have to go to the power siding board outside of the municipal Also the cooperatives, the rural electric cooperatives, which are governed by federal charter, are doing similar programs. But that's what's going on so far. Richard, did you have any you said well, had I, a few questions? One, one question I sort of tried to bring out and I, I didn't get it for me a clear answer, which okay. is, okay, I'm, I see three categories of power generation. I see power generation for what I'm going to call personal use, or, mm -hmm. or my, my business, okay? Right. I'm going to, I, on one end. On the other end is power generation, and we're talking solar for the most part right now, above um, 50 megawatts, that's regulated by the siding board. That category in between, all right, you know, 40 megawatts of generation. I'm mm -hmm. selling power to a municipality, the grid, whatever. I'm okay. selling power. Is that considered to be agriculture or can I regulate it? If it's under 50 megawatts, yes, you can. As a matter of fact, any project under 50 megawatts. Right. Even though it solar. sits here and That's calls correct. it agriculture. That's correct. Okay. Because remember this, um, under Ohio law, production of generation for sale is not agricultural product yet. But yeah, it comes under that particular jurisdiction. Okay, so that would still be a commercial. That's correct. Okay. Now okay. you also understand and appreciate why you see um, many, if not all, of these solar projects above 50 megawatts of capacity. Many of them start at 100. Um, there are seven things that the power siding board needs to consider before it renders its decision. Um, one of those is the need for the facility. 
when you talk about electricity being local, PJM, which is Pennsylvania, Jersey, Maryland, Interconnect, that is a network of power generation and large-scale transmission lines that link a number of communities and utility service systems, such as DPNL, your local municipal electric company has part of that under PJM. Mm -hmm. That is parts of 13 different states, from the Carolinas to Chicago. That's local, which means when that hits the system under trade arbitrage, you can actually call possession of that in 13 states. Many people need to understand that. When you talk about local production, mm -hmm. local production is 13 states. And the need for power reduction is absolutely huge. Um, when you talk about technical capability, being able to do this efficiently, effectively, safely, reliability, that comes under the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, PJM, and what's called NERC, or the North American Electric Reliability Council, which means this. I have to have a permit. This is my technical capability. If I'm going to put this solar array here, and I'm going to interconnect into the system here, it has to meet all those requirements for safety, reliability, those things. That's federal. Um, probable environmental impact on the community. Should you have part of the say with regard to that? The answer is yes, yes. which means that's one of the things there. Water and air quality compliance. Yeah, because remember this, when they're building it, if you're crossing a stream, <coughs> dust control, those types of things, that has to do with air and water. Should you have a say with regard to that? The answer is yes. Um, facility for public interest, convenience, and necessity. As I said, local is 13 states. Public, that thing is a 13 state particular area. It's not local. When we say, when it, when it talks about being local, that's what local me means in those. Uh, impact on viability of agricultural land. We talk about farm drainage, we talk about soil, we because, talk about all that. Yeah, you know, one of the things that comes to my mind that the temptation would be to cut down all the hedgerows. Well, yeah. But then, it, then it's not viable agricultural land after that. Which means this, that all has to be basically negotiated. Clear cut is not necessarily going to mean, you know, those are the things, and should you have a say in being able to negotiate that? The answer is yes. yes. Um, also, water conservation practices, farm drainage, yes. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, there's the big three having to do with that that are technical requirements that are multi-state different things. But when you take a look, there are four requirements that need your input in some way, shape, or form. You can see how important it is for the local governments to get involved in this process. <clears throat> there are a number of local governments in eastern Ohio because of coal fired generation and different things there from the early part of the 30s through the end of the last century. They understood and appreciated that and have done these practices using this. But when you're talking about power generation, which is going from very, very large centralized systems to more decentralized ones, the ability basically, this is a once in a generation, or for many folks, especially in Western Ohio, this is a rather new basic approach, which means the ability and the need for new education and outreach to bring county governments up to speed, township governments up to speed, schools up to speed is huge. It occurs to me that, that putting out you know, it's a brand new thing, but nevertheless, putting out quite a bit of energy in the planning phase is probably going to be worthwhile because suppose, we say, a solar array gets built and then there are drainage problems. Getting them fixed is going to be very difficult. Well, now you understand, basically, the need to have engineers, the need to have land improvement contractors, the need to take a look at that. Case in point, I'd say this. I'm not going to name the company, but just last week, um, in a conference with the Power Siding Board, one of the folks basically in a project that's coming forward said, we have a concern with regard to farm drainage and that. Who do we talk to? And they said, you know, just up the streets, this crazy guy at the Ohio Farm Bureau, his name is such and such, give him a call. I got a call and I met with them and I said, all right, if you're talking about doing these structures, here are some competent land improvement contractors, soil technicians, others that you can work with at the local and state level as you create your plan. And yes, we're going to be involved basically 
as a stipulating part in the end having to do with farm drainage. It's interesting too is, is this. Some of, I, some of the people I've worked with, not only in solar, but in wind and in pipelines, you're going to be working with engineers who have probably put in power stations all over the world. But this is their first time east of the Mississippi. And when one of them basically says, you know, Mr. Arnold, what's this stuff called field tile? <laughs> That's where the conversation <clears throat> starts. Because remember this, don't ever cut yourself short. I tell farmers this. Yes, you're going to be working with experts who know how to put power generation just about any place in the world. But your area of expertise basically is farming and agriculture and land drainage and those things, which they know nothing about. When given the opportunity and they ask a question, that is a teachable moment, and you need to teach them. The other fear that, that I've heard brought up is, okay, so one of two things, the, the project is implemented and uh, the company goes bankrupt or something like that or the, the project goes for its 30 year lifespan and then nobody wants it anymore. It's well, not viable. What makes it get removed? That's a good question. Because I tell you, if this was a wind project and this was in the enabling legislation basically for wind is that you have to post a bond the financial instrument which means the financial resources are there before you break ground if this thing needs to be decommissioned and torn out by the state because you're belly up the financial resources are there they're not there yet for solar which I tell landowners this is what you need to do you need to have in your lease agreement where they post a financial bond, which means if they go belly up, that financial bond is surrendered, and those resources basically remove or decommission the facility from your land. So, so you can ask for a bond anyway. Oh yes, because a lot of people are finding this out too. Anything and everything that you have is negotiable. Everything in those particular leases with a farm are negotiable too. Hmm. And also remember this, you have the ability to also say this, well, if you are going to be here and it's not stated in the individual lease agreement you've negotiated with the farmer, you're going to be in our township. Consequently, we would like to see negotiated that there is a financial bond where that basically is, is yeah. done. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. also remember, be important. Yeah. yeah, because also remember this, this is also very important because each of these renewable energy projects are designed to be easily upgradable. Do not be a bit surprised after 10 years of operation the company comes in with more effective technology and replaces the solar panels. So mm -hmm. You see a 100 megawatt facility go to 100. Oh, yeah, that, that doesn't surprise me, that, yeah. that possibility. I mean, it's like the cell towers are constantly changing. Changing, which upgrading. also means this. You want to make sure the financial instruments are in place that if they are seeing a greater economic benefit because of the upgrade, mm -hmm. the community sees it. And you want to negotiate that into a stipulated agreement too. But what, in defining this minimum, well, in defining the size, 15 megawatts, uh, does the land have to be contiguous? Not necessarily. I will tell you this. Um, you have some very large, 100 thousand acre tracks with two or three of the projects where it's one landowner from that or you see a couple of them um, if you went to let me think in Brown County which is Hillcrest that is a thousand acre facility but it's not a thousand continuous acres there are 100 acre patches with 10 different landowners in a three township area but for the fifth but to reach the 50 does it have to be continued? Yes. And I tell you, economically you're going to see that because you're going to have to have an interconnection point. You're going to have to have a centralized substation and collection point to the transmission line, which means economically it's going to have to be continued, you know, connected with that particular area. Well, I feel like this is a good basis for more questions. Yeah, but um, well, I think the other one is that maybe the individual landowners need to know 
all the points that they need to cover when, before they make that lease, because the lease isn't uniform. They, no. every, every lease could be different with every landowner. Well, remember this, there's no such thing as a group lease. They are all individual contracts, which means this, welcome to my world. So the, the landowner understand. that doesn't remember to put the bond in, is he going to have a bond? So I hand it out. Uh, those who sign this on the hood of their pickup truck do at their own peril. You're correct. Yes. Uh, Ohio State Extension Service has printouts, or, you know, has memos for yeah. what to do. Eric Romick does a wonderful job on yeah. uh, And I think it answers. Mm -hmm. No, is, no, I think. And, and I handed is, this out at the. Do we want to, as, 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 as government, to distribute that information? Well, we actually, we talked about it and said that I would be allowed to <coughs> spend township money right. to mail to uh, landowners. And I haven't done that, but I did distribute, when the Tecumseh Land Trust had a uh, uh, land, uh, landowner's resource Mm -hmm. event, something like that, uh, last month. But. I hope I've given you enough basically to chew on. If I've left okay. you with more questions and answers, that's fine. It's good. Yes. Yeah. But I'm saying this, if you would like to continue this conversation, please have me back again. There, there's nothing in the rule books that says I can only come here once. <laughs> and there have been some townships in northern Ohio, I've been back to four or five or six times to give updates and things, or they've worked closely with their county farm bureaus, where the county farm bureaus are sponsored by myself and others to come in to do workshops and education outreach with their constituents mm -hmm. on this issue, and they'll be more than happy to work with you. Well, thanks, thanks for the offer, and, and certainly I can envision if we get to the point where these uh, lease, lease companies, what, I forget the name of them, but anyway, if, if they get close to the point where they're getting uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I've been told they need 400 more acres. Yeah, I've, I've been told they're not enough to, you know, to move ahead. Yeah, they'll be a bit. Well, yeah. you, you can finish. Uh, Richard finished for me. Okay. Yeah, we've gotten to that point. Well, there's nothing wrong with it because <laughs> I'll tell you this: it's interesting when companies send out agents to talk to farmers about leasing. Uh, there's two or three groups of folks who find out about it very quickly within mm -hmm. a matter of. Hours, and that's basically you as township trustees, because everybody's saying, I'm calling the township trustee on mm -hmm. this, yeah. or it's the county commissioner's office. Mm -hmm. And then they also call the Farm Bureau. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, and yeah. there's nothing wrong, you know, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. Being able to help folks, and I say, um, in many cases, you know, landowners and our policy is landowners have the right to enter effective agreements and programs with energy service providers. However, they also have the responsibility to do it well, not only basically sure. for the benefit of their family, but also their community. And yeah. that's what we do. We give them a number of tools that they can utilize when they're making those decisions. Mm -hmm. that's good. And as yeah. you heard earlier, it's counter to our comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much, Dale. We You're quite welcome, sir. Yeah, we certainly do. Um, where are you headed? I'm going back home to Newark. 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 Uh, but if yeah. you need anything, you have my card. I'll send you a copy of my presentation so you can see what we do on workshops. And there, sir, is me if you got questions. Well, I'm more likely to pass it on to constituents that are okay. That yeah. All right. Well, gentlemen, if there's no other questions or whatever, I. I uh, Beg your indulgence, so let me leave. <laughs> no. Certainly, yeah. You, you don't have to wait for the end. Okay. Well, thank you very much. All right. Well, we will certainly. Thanks for visiting. Plan You're welcome. Seeing you at, uh, again at other venues, too. Okay. All right. Nice to meet you. You probably had smaller audiences, but not too much smaller. <laughs> no, there's not. Oh, I don't ever count. Uh, the, the largest group I talked to at one time was on oil and gas, and that was 800 people. Holy. Oh. And the smallest group I've talked to is, I do a lot of work with township trustees, and so, yeah. Wasn't the Farm Bureau behind agritourism? Um, in some cases, yes, but you know, it's interesting. When you talk about agritourism, we just had our state annual meeting. And I really like what you had to say, because when you talk about agritourism, 
the root word is agra. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. And a number of folks are going to try to, under an agritourism banner, to do something contrary to what it is. Um, we have those challenges too. But thank you, sir. Don, good seeing you again. If you need anything else, please give me a call. I look forward to working with you guys again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Try to say Yes, please. Watch out for those deer. Oh, I do. Mm -hmm. Deer are already gone to sleep. So. Okay, so moving along, um, this cluster report. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> well, as you can see, there's yet another um, resolution amending permanent appropriation. It's 2018 55. And in the general fund, I uh, increased contracted services by $40. In the gas tax fund, I increased medical hospitalization by $447. Excuse me, in the fire fund, I increased medical hospitalization by $1,970. Travel and meeting expenses increased by $50. Telephone increased by $110. Advertising increased by $480. Water and sewer increased by $12. Natural gas increased by $400. And operating supplies increased by $240. Is there a motion to approve resolution 2018-55? I shall move. I second any further discussion regarding this resolution. Hearing none, may we vote, please. Mr. Meacher? Yes. Mr. Hollister? Yes. And um, resolution 2018-56 is a long time coming. It is, <laughs> uh, um, fund 2902 was originally established to receive FEMA funds when we had a major storm, and I think that was maybe in 2008. And um, so every year, at the end of the year, in order to dissolve that fund, it has to be done within the year, within this year basically, and, and have to transfer the balance out of that fund, and there's been 80 cents sitting in that fund forever, and I always forget until the beginning of the new year, and anyway, that's what this, this resolution is too. Um, it says, whereas fund 2902 was established to hold FEMA funds, and whereas the aforementioned funds have been depleted, therefore fund 2902 is no longer necessary, now therefore it is the desire of Miami Township to dissolve the Fund 2902 and transfer the 86 cents balance to the general fund. I shall move. Moved out a second. Any further discussion regarding resolution 2018-56? Hearing none, may we vote, please. Mr. Mutcher? Yes. Mr. Hollister? Yes. It's a shame we couldn't have included the Clifton Clip Fund, Clifton Ambulance Fund, but that, but what? it's another day. The Clifton, what now? Um, what fund? Right. 2042. No, no, 204, 2041. Oh, that's a, a, the cemetery that we we don't do anything with. Mm -hmm. But I mean, but we still hold the monies there, so it has to stay there. We can't dissolve it. Okay. okay. Anything else? Uh, no. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, Richard, your time's up. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Ah. There's couple other things and we'll get through here real quick. Let's see, Richard. Uh, yeah, I have nothing for standing committee reports of interest down to you. Oh, only that the uh, Clifton Union Cemetery Board did meet. Mm -hmm. uh, no, nothing spectacular. To... No? Am I missing something? Not really. Uh, that can wait till next meeting. That can wait till next meeting. Uh, I have asked a local website design person to to put together a um, pre, pre, not a presentation. I'm not sure what's going to work out to be to pretty up our our new website. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm let everybody know that House Bill 500 passed. That's the Omnibus Township Bill. There's like 15 different provisions. Only about four or five, perhaps, uh, are applicable to us in our size. I guess the biggest one for us is uh, if the governor signs it, we'll no longer be able to, to have the position of president and vice president of the, of the board of trustees will have to be chair and vice chair at that <laughs> point. Important thing. Um, there's a uh, bill on, on Governor Kasich's desk which would uh, give township employees, uh, township elected officials pay raises um, uh, of um, 1.74%, I guess, beginning in 2019. 
uh, but that is only applicable to newly elected or only new termed raises, which we, we've come, uh, encountered those before. Um, uh, Richard did tell me that the BZA hearing was held last week and the uh, petition for variance was granted by the, by the applicant. Um, we do need to, uh, within this calendar year, we need to adopt resolution 2018-57, which is the uh, provision of service of fire rescue emergency medical and fire inspection service from Miami Township, Green County, Ohio to Bath Township, Green County, Ohio. Before everybody gets all excited, this is basically, word for word, the exact same thing as what was in the agreement that we signed uh, between the two entities. And one of the provisions of that agreement was for a resolution to be passed. And I didn't question it in the past. Uh, when we discussed it with Bath Township and we agreed to it. And so um, that's what so we're the, doing here. The amount of dollars in the agreement does not need to be in the resolution? It is. It's right here. 110,000, 56 okay. up front, 54 uh, just didn't July 15th. Uh, so this, uh, I would uh, entertain a motion to approve resolution 2018-57. Uh, I so move. I'll second any for the discussion regarding that resolution. Hearing none, may we vote please. Mr. Mucher? Yes. Mr. Hollister? Yes. Thank you. Um, did, were you prepared to have a zoning commission nomination this evening? No. Okay. Thank you very much. I have nothing further. Anyone else from old business and new business? I have a motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> Peace out. <laughs>